moderator for today's session. So I will be guiding us through our programme and facilitating some, some questions. I'm a ceramic artist um, and I combine that work with my work as a business advisor and a project manager. Um, and I've been very lucky to be just a little bit involved in the Alter Matter One project. Uh, very lucky to um, hear the dissemination event at the end of the project and, and become familiar with the really inspiring projects that happened as a result of Alter Matter One. So this is a project very dear to my own heart. Um, I do a lot of material research in my own practice um, and try to adopt circular approaches to, to practice. So I'm delighted that we can, we can be welcoming you to potentially participate in Alter Matter 2. So before uh, we get sort of into the meat of today, I want to just share my screen um, and talk you through some of the practicalities starting with if everybody can see my screen okay if i can if somebody can yep we're good fantastic so what i wanted to do was just start with a few um house rules just for the smooth running of today so if i could ask you just to kindly keep your mic muted throughout the session because it really does play havoc sometimes with feedback so that would be great we are recording the session which i think you may have realized already with the, the announcement. So you are, by joining us, you are ag agreeing to be part of that. But if you feel very strongly you don't want to appear on screen, do please feel you can turn your camera off. Um, as a practical aspect, we will be having question and answers later um, once we've, we've heard from our speakers. So please do pop your, your questions into the chat so that we can, I can gather them up um, and ask our speakers and the project organizers on your behalf. Um, if you could also just say who you are and, and where you're from, that would be really useful as well. We do have a simultaneous interpretation option. So if you are wanting to listen to uh, the podcast, uh, the podcast, the, the <laughs> today's webinar in uh, a different language, please, Click the globe button and you can choose the language that you want to, to listen in. And I suppose just a warning that obviously we're online and as much as we hope we won't have any technical glitches, we, we apologise in advance if there are and we'll, we'll, we hope, we hope we'll, it will all be smooth. So with the house rules in place, let me see if I can move my screen on and I'm not able to for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, there we are, right. So I wanted really just to give you all a very brief introduction to Alter Matter um, and to talk a little bit about the reasons why it, it came about because there really is an urgent and increasing need for all of us globally to address climate change and to really look at our patterns of consumption. Um, and one of the important things for this project is really looking at the role of craft in exploring new ways of working, new models of practice, and ways in which we can work globally and collaboratively to address some of these issues. And so Ultimata brought together uh, pairings of UK and Indonesian uh, designers, makers and material experimenters to explore new types of material together. Um, that was done in a, a sort of four stage process that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and the whole programme was, was sort of run both online and offline, um, including an exhibition and dissemination event at the end. And I suppose the big question is really why alternative materials? We really um, have huge opportunities as we design and make products to think about materials in new ways. Um, Indonesia has some you know, 
difficulties in, in terms of the, the production, the sheer scale of production of waste material. Um, so it, it, it's an urgent need um, from an Indonesian perspective, but also globally, because obviously the, the waste, the non-biodegradable waste that is just building and building is a, is a global problem that we all need to, to think about. So there is this pressing and urgent need for practitioners to really think about things differently, to think about the way they tell stories, to think about the way they can actually lead in good and sustainable practice, and to think about ways of encouraging each other and uh, the wider population out there to, to, to think about the way we consume and adopt more circular approaches to the way that we work. And through the Ultimata project, it was an opportunity to bring different disciplines together, to put different knowledge um, into the conversation and to look for new solutions together. Oh. I'm, for some reason, uh, I'm still not managing to move my slides on very effectively. Oh, there we go, we'll just do it that way. So just to briefly mention the organisers, again, it was a, a collaborative project with, um, led by the British Council, um, and then bringing in Partners Cast Foundation, um, an Indonesian-based organisation, um, really looking at innovative solutions in this intersection between disciplines. Playo, a social design studio, um, really sort of encouraging collaboration and looking at new ways of um, looking at resources. And Applied Art Scotland, which is a member-led organization based in Scotland, really looking at um, exchange, knowledge exchange and skill exchange in ways of developing craft and creative practice. And there were different elements uh, to the program and we, we will sort of explore those a little bit more through our speakers and, and through um, our conversation later on. But it was really thinking about ways to facilitate conversation between stakeholders and thinking about um, the way that the material development within the project could really um, sort of lead to new products, new ways of working. And the outcome of the, the project was really to end up with some new models, some prototypes. Um, and it was really impressive, I have to say, at the dissemination event to discover just how much had been done in a very short space of time. Uh, so when you're determined and inspired, anything is, is possible. The, we're not going to go into detail because we just want to get, get started with hearing from our speakers today. But if you want to look at any more detail from the previous participants, if you have a look at the Automata website um, on the CAST Foundation website, you'll, you'll get much more of the detail. But I suppose just to give you a brief summary, a, ten, a tantalizing summary of what, what came out of, of last year's um, uh, projects, we had uh, one particular um, Textile-based uh, collaboration using natural fibers, um, weave, wave, and they created really stunning interior design screens, real statement pieces. We had the dimple, and we'll be hearing from Fred Bryan as one of our speakers today, so he can tell you much more about the the beautiful tiles that they created using really toxic waste materials um, from cigarette butts, which is a, a really inspiring story. We had soft edges, uh, beautiful furniture created with soft bumpers created from mycelium. We had sisal, new materials made from seashell waste and bonding bamboo, uh, creating beautiful everyday objects from hazardous bamboo production waste, dust and, and strands. So really exciting and inspiring stories. And, and you can find out more about those by going onto the website. So let's talk a little bit about Automata 2. The application deadline is April 16th, um, and the, the application process is, is very straightforward. We can answer some specific questions around that um, as, we, as we go on. 
Um, and I think just briefly to talk about the sort of participant requirements, uh, really we're looking for people who have two to three years minimum of professional working experience in, in this sort of broad range of craft design, making and material development. We want to encourage people to apply who are already a little bit familiar with material development. We want them to be able to sort of get off and running quite quickly. It's a, it's a short time frame, So it's important that you, you, you have some sort of familiarity with that already. And you need to be based, or certainly du during the program while it runs, you need to be based in either Indonesia or Scotland. You've got to want to work collaboratively with um, inspiring partners in, other, in another country and be ready and willing and excited about the prospect of testing new materials. You'll need to be comfortable working online because obviously so much of the work will need to be done online using Zoom, using WhatsApp. So really sort of um, hoping that those are really easy tools for you to, to work with. And we need you be, to be committed to working together on the residency and undertaking the prototyping. And the, the language that will be used is, is English. So it, it's really important that you feel comfortable um, with, with English as, as a way to communicate. And really, I suppose, just to, for me, just to really talk a little bit about the benefits of participation, um, because I think the potential of new alternative materials is so important, as we've talked about. We've got an urgent and pressing need to address climate change and, and pollution and the problems that we've created for ourselves. And we want to use this project to really showcase and um, raise the, the questions that craft can answer in terms of experimentation and innovation. We want to be able to help and facilitate that collaborative process. And we want to really strengthen the amazing relationships that are already in place between Indonesia and the UK. And we want to really raise this subject for deeper discussion. And also it's useful to know that there is a fee uh, for participants, it, it it doesn't cover every moment that you would be on the project because I think there's so much more to be gained from the project, but important to recognize the, the time commitment and the fee for that. So just giving you quickly a timeline and we can talk a little bit more about this if people have questions. Um, but I I think the as we're recording this, um, and I'm sure the slides will be made available so that you can refer back to this, the detail of this information, um, not have to absorb it all immediately. Um, and the application can be accessed online. So that's the whistle stop tour really, um, from my perspective, I'm gonna, I'm going to stop sharing because our our structure for today is really that I'm going to introduce um, now our um, British Council colleague Kenny to to do a bit of a backdrop to the project um, and how it got got started. Um, then we'll be hearing from three inspirational speakers to talk about their experience of material research and development. And as I say. Um, Debrian is actually one of the previous participants, so we can talk a little bit about that too. And then we'll have a question and answer session. So please do put those questions into the chat as we go. But I'm now going to hand over to Kemi to just say a little bit more about how it all came to be. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful whistle-stop tour of Altamata program. Um, I'm really excited to welcome the second round of Altamata this year. Um, so as uh, Carol had mentioned before, um, my name is Kamele Harahap, but you can call me Kemi. Um, I am the head of arts and creative industries at British Council in Indonesia. Very happy to be here with you all today. Um, but first and foremost, I'd also like to wish to those of you who are observing the holy month of Ramadan, wishing you a blessed Ramadan month and may this month bring you prosperity and joy. 
Um, once again, it's great to see you all at the Ultramatter Volume 2 webinar today. Uh, this event is the first in a series of Ultramatter Volume 2 programs, which are the result of a partnership between British Council, CAS Foundation, PLEO, and Applied Arts Scotland. It's an honor for me to be able to open the webinar today on behalf of British Council. Um, as you might know, the British Council is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities. We build connections, understanding, and trust between people in the UK and other countries through arts and culture, education, and the English language. In our arts and culture programs, our programs focus to develop uh, and build new connections, relationship, and networks between UK and Indonesian artists and arts organizations. We do this in various ways, one of which is through, for instance, grant programs, such as connections to culture or international collaboration grants. This kind of grant program is intended to support collaboration between UK artists and organizations with Indonesian artists and organizations or with other countries. We've held the CTC grant since 2019, and in the last round of November 2022, we provided grants for a total of 11 new UK and Indonesia collaboration projects. But addition to, in addition to grants, we also collaborate with various stakeholders to develop a more inclusive and sustainable creative economy sector. Indonesia itself has a lot of potential and ambition to become um, a, a global leader uh, in creative economy, especially in the Southeast Asia region. Um, last year, some of you might know, Indonesia hosted the G20 global event. And this year, Indonesia has become the chairman of um, ASEAN. This is a huge momentum for Indonesia, and the UK is also ready to support these ambitions in our capacity as one of ASEAN's newest dialogue partners. But of course, in addition to these two programs, we focus a lot on developing craft sector through our global program called the Arts Respond to Global Challenges. Through this program, we see how arts has a transformative role in responding to global issues such as climate change, diversity and inclusion, as well as cultural heritage. In Indonesia, we carry a lot of the themes around sustainability, circular economy, and biomaterials, because these are the areas that have been spotlighted due to the effects of climate change and environmental issues. So issues of uh, climate change and environment are, of course, very important to all of us. In 2021, the UK had the opportunity to host the largest conference on climate named uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Even though the results of COP26 and later on COP27 in Egypt are still in process, we are aware that to make viable change, we actually need support from all sectors, including us from the arts and creative industry sector. Moreover, we believe that the arts and creative industry sector actually has a really unique way of being able to raise these issues to the general public. And in particular, the design and craft sector can contribute to finding new solutions and innovations. So we see that international cooperation through cultural relations is the key to finding common development solutions by encouraging cross-sectoral, intergenerational, and international collaborations, and bringing new voices across the sectors, we seek more innovative, creative, and sustainable solutions to the climate crisis that we all face. This is what led us to work with Applied Arts Scotland, CAS Foundation, and PLEO for the Ultramatter program. We also believe that the dialogue between Indonesia and the UK both of which are countries that have a very important role in climate change, must provide an appropriate platform and strengthen their cooperation. Indonesia, with its rich natural resource, also has an approach to sustainability that is unique to our history and cultural heritage, whereas UK is known for its strength in research and development and technology. We believe that sharing this knowledge can not only benefit both parties, but can also contribute to the global conversation about alternative materials and environmental sustainability. The Ultramatter program has been running since early 2022, and this year we are opening an open call for designers and makers in Indonesia and Scotland to join this year's cohort. Um, as Clarell had mentioned, selected participants will then be paired up to collaborate in exploring new materials, taking part in online workshops, and receiving mentorship from Indonesian and Scottish mentors. At the end of the online program, participants will present prototypes of their innovations, as well as having the opportunity to do face-to-face -face residencies. The deadline for applying this program is in April on the 16th, 
And if you have any questions about the program or the application process itself, we're ready to answer your questions during the Q&A session later on um, in this webinar. So once again, thank you very much for your time and attention. We're really excited to hear the sharing from our speakers today. And thank you, Carol, for, your for the time. And I'll hand the screen back to you. Lovely. Thank you, Kemi. That was great sort of overview and, and felt very motivating. Um, it's an exciting project to, to be involved in. So let's hope we get lots of applications. But without further ado, I think we're going to move on to our speakers who are going to be really inspiring in terms of the work that they do um, with material research. So first of all, I'm going to welcome Adi to, uh, to share his story with us. Um, Adi is a, a lecturer, a researcher, and runs his own design studio. Um, uses some unexpected materials, I would say, perhaps, but I'm, I'm going to say no more than that, because I think, Adi, you, you can tell the story better than me. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Selamat malam. Good evening. So, I want to share the screen first. Okay. This show now? Yep, we're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. This this call. Uh, yeah. First, I I think I should thank to British Council and Altermeter for inviting me to share my story about working and uh, playing with the uh, cow dam. Yeah. <laughs> this is the material that I uh, now uh, work a lot. Yeah, with so this cow dung projects uh, I'm going to share are based on ongoing multidiscipline research project in Bandung Institute of Technology, uh, ITB, that explores the use of cow dung as an agricultural waste to be developed into functional products. Uh, Lembang district of West Bandung as a location of this project is famous because of its agriculture products, especially milk. The region is a host of hundreds of small scale milk producers. This has been increasing environmental problem in this region as most of the farmers litter the waste, the cow dung, in unwise manner. I thought, yeah, this cow dung waste has been polluting landfill and water, thus creating bad smell in the village. Because I live in these areas, so the most inspiration of this doing uh, or doing this cow dung collection is based on my very deep concern and frustration, in fact, regarding how to reduce this agricultural, especially cow dung waste that mostly going easily to the landfill and river by processing it into a raw material for making different products. To be honest, I would say that my main motivation was purely environmental issues. That is how to solve agricultural waste problem in my area where I live. So connecting to that issues, uh, I think there are also some other issues we face today. Uh, sustainable innovation strategy tend to focus on technocentric approaches without embracing the socio-cultural aspects of communities and individuals. My aim is how to create products 
by utilizing the waste materials, the cow dung, while at the same time applying a community-based design approach with a combination of ethnography research and participatory methods. So our research uh, that started in 2021 focused on how to process the cow dung to suit all criteria and property to be used as a durable material for making a product. To date, the research team that consists of designers, mechanical engineering, and material scientists has resulted the efficient and practical ways to do that. In principle, the wall process consists of cleaning, filtering, drying, molding, finishing, and assembling. In brief, it can be described as following. So the dung is cleaned first with water that can be removed the dirt and the smell. After getting clean, it is dried and then mixed with specific additive. By this stage, we have already a ready mixture of material for making a certain shape and an object. Shaping process is done by casting the flattened cow down on the mold surface, layer by layer until it really gets the right shape and being dried until hard. The mold can be dried using a dehydrator for about 10 hours or let it dry naturally in room temperature for about one week. After it's completely dry, we can remove it from the mold and go to the finishing process, such as sanding and coating. Assembling parts and components is the final steps of this process. So uh, the first idea of this project, in fact, uh, to make how we can make just simple product that can be distributed and marketed locally, such as a brick, flower pot, or water container. Lembang is the area or the place of hundreds of greenhouses that grow different flowers and cactus, which is then for sure they need a lot of flower pot and water container. So we have thought also about making brick products to support local construction demands. But sadly, later on, our study has found out that we cannot make a good money or good economy with this stuff. Nobody buy, for example, one single brick for uh, 5,000 rupiah. So nobody will buy it or maybe neither Nobody will buy flower pot with uh, 100,000 rupiah. So people uh, get used to use a plastic pot instead of other materials. So they can very get with this plastic material, very cheap price, uh, and they can get a lot of uh, flower pots. So our idea is, uh, to making this first experiment, like uh, making a flower pot or water container, uh, has a lot of uh, challenge by, by the fact that uh, it doesn't meet the economical aspect of this project. So then uh, we try to change our direction and we decided that why don't we make some uh, like product belong to lifestyle like uh, uh, or home decor like uh, speakers or uh, even table lamp or even just uh, furniture objects so with this object 
if we make these lifestyle products, so we can sell one product, for example, we can get even 1 million rupiah for one each of product. Like we have tried to produce a speakers that can that we can sell in the market for price about 2 million uh, rupiah. So this is this is the process that how we change our direction from first making something that can be circulated in the village, but then we shift to make a product belong to lifestyle, lifestyle product that can be even marketed widely uh, overseas. So uh, this is just uh, one example that our development to make a table lamp that, that has been exhibited in uh, Singapore and in Jakarta later on in Bali. So that received a lot of uh, attention and even order to market it overseas. So this is also another example that how we develop the products that not only uh, uh, make a, like a water container, but maybe it is better that if this belong to a home decor objects that can be value, uh, that can has better economical value than only just a water container. And this, this is also another example that the product that we develop for lifestyle products. So we develop, for example, three different kinds of speakers and it can cost in the market is about 2 million rupiah and it it going well yeah if you compare we use the same exactly material uh, this speaker uh, this exactly the same amount of material here if we make a brick or uh, these speakers the only difference is, of course, speaker, we should have some electronic component to put inside. Yeah, but it's it doesn't cost so much also for that. And another one is we can uh, develop also some furniture product like stool, but stool that we can combine an, uh, this uh, cow dung product with, uh, for example, with rattan. So this is, for example, some pictures that we have exhibit uh, some of our collection, new collection, that's all objects made of cow dung in Jakarta last year. So to uh, sum up, uh, by now, these cow dung products has been gone to some step of experimentation and laboratory study. Through many steps of cleaning process, I would say that it is safe and hygienic material. However, what we have not done yet is to make this material certified. countdown based product is still a new thing in the design field and we still have to study and collect much information to go to that step. Yeah, uh, we, for, uh, to be honest, we, we don't have yet get any certification to, to make this product uh, more available for uh, the wider market. After all, apart from offering a positive impact to the environment, this COVID-19 project also will contribute positively toward a local social and economic growth. Community empowerment activities can provide a new jobs opportunity in the village, thus reducing the wave of urbanization, which is another complex problem. So uh, we, uh, at the end, I would like to say that our project to deal with cow dung, it's not only about how to create 
new materials, but we have also two different aspects that we deal with. First, we develop community development in the village, and we also uh, have created some kind of creative industry by uh, providing a job and economical value possibility to the villager. So as a summary, uh, first, uh, sustainable strategy that uh, mostly tend to centric uh, approach without uh, clearly embracing the social cultural aspect of community and individual. This is what uh, we, we face that I think not only Indonesia, but mostly in the other developing country. And we deal with the animal farming and agricultural product in Lembang, West Java, that produce a lot of waste streams such as uh, cow dung. So the idea of our project is how to create products by utilizing the waste material, the cow dung, while at the same time applying a community-based design approach with a combination of ethnography research and participatory remote method. So our outcome is new design method that easily applicable and accepted by Lembang local communities and also marketable craft-based products from cow dung, such as brick, panels, small boxes, even lifestyle products like uh, speakers and table line. Okay, with making this uh, or developing this uh, new material, we connect uh, the activity of community development with uh, creative industry and hopefully so it also creates some kind of uh, uh, what we call now uh, circular economy because the cow dung is from the village and then the one who make it to produce is a local people and then we distribute the market also the product locally for the use of local people so thank you very much Thank you so much, Adi, for that fascinating um, presentation. I know I've got lots of questions for you, and I think they may start coming from our audience very soon too, but we'll, we'll come back to you later um, yeah. and ask you some of those questions. Thank you so much for getting us started with inspiring stories. Um, so now I'd, I'd like to invite Febrian to come and tell us his story. Um, some again unexpected and really quite tricky materials that you were working with um so can i invite you to to tell us your story now okay hi everyone hi carol thank you uh, for having me uh, thank you playo uh, uh let me share screen uh, Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Fabrian. Uh, I'm a product designer. I'm also uh, Ultramatter alumni, uh, volume one uh, last year. And then I want to introduce what I'm doing in Bandung in Indonesia. Uh, I have a studio design called Contour Concrete Lab, uh, found by me and my partner Edo Fernando, and now it's become a group of researcher, uh, mostly is product designer and interior designer, work uh, to develop design and also uh, materials uh, through material, concrete materials. And then uh, yeah, we make a product objects, uh, mostly for architecture. And then uh, I will show what, our, what we're doing in, in here. This is a bench uh, made from concrete. And then this is this this one also and endless pandemic uh, and in pandemic our 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 project is become bigger because uh, mostly commercial area and architect uh, work on outdoor uh, projects. That's why uh, we 
we get a lot of uh, chance to work with more architect. And then this is one also, uh, we work make a bench. This one, we, we do explore uh, many type of stools and then outdoor bands. This one also. And then this is also uh, make a post machine for a residential. Uh, we do custom made uh, for the shape and the details. And this one also. And this is a small product uh, that we made for uh, retail. Uh, it's a ashtray. And this one also we collab with uh, Sans uh, brand called Oaken. We do the design. Uh, so the, the concern of Oaken uh, want to uh, reuse the bottle, uh, glass bottle inside. And then we, we make the cover after the first uh, buying to, to the Oaken. And then we, we put the cover, uh, this one. And then uh, so the so the customer can only buy the refill uh, sense. This one also our retail products. And then uh, since 2018, we try to uh, concentrate to make a waste material product development. And then this one, uh, we try to collab with Parampong. The first uh, material that we research is a cigarette butt uh, because mostly our project is commercial area, hotel, cafe, and then uh, some of the owners just asked to me, Fab, can you uh, make something from this cigarette butt? Because too, too much in, in their, their cafe. And then uh, I think we try to make the, the, the filter and make something with, uh, we treat as a fiber in a, our concrete material. And then we, we curious that how we can get hygiene of this material because it's so dangerous for the process. And then we map uh, Parompong. Parompong is a waste management company that have a machine called hydrothermal. Hydrothermal is, uh, I don't know how to uh, presto, what in English? High pressure press. Uh, it's like high press cooker. Uh, it's 200 uh, Celsius degree. And then, uh, yeah, it's uh, the fact is the the cigarette butt is sterilized using this uh, hydrothermal machine, and then this is the process. Uh, we get to cook the materials, and then we dry using direct sun, and then the result is to the pulp and liquid. The liquid is uh, can use for compost, uh, and then the pulp is uh, we use for. Uh, our fiber in concrete. This one. Uh, before we found uh, the cigarette, but we use fiber. We we import to buy to use uh, to to make a strength of our concrete and then replace and the uh, and get the same result. This is the raw texture that we can make from cigarette but waste, and then we develop to another texture we call lunar. Also, lunar is a another texture of cigarette butt material. And then this is uh, many products what, that we made, pot and then tiles, and also the, the, the outdoor furniture and stool that uh, made from cigarette butt. And this one also uh, coming skis of culture brand. Uh, we make a, like a boot like Supreme, like a, like we want to communicate to uh, more uh, big market to Kamengski audience. And then this is uh, our latest design uh, furniture for outdoor. It's made from 3,500 3, cigarette pathways. And then this is uh, our lights project, uh, but not only made from cigarette butt, this is in Sunset Park, this of Toto Head Bali. We just did it uh, last week, finished last week. And then this is a, a 31 meter bench uh, made with 600 kilo of multi-layer plastic, snack packaging waste, like in the sense, uh, packaging. And then this is made uh, from concrete and then uh, we mix it with multi-layer plastic.
And now we are doing research many times of residue waste, cigarette butt waste, this disposable mass waste, uh, multi-layer plastic, baby diaper waste, and C-cell waste. And then I want to uh, share about uh, the Dimple Tiles project with uh, Ali Stair PRs. In this project, uh, I do uh, as a material designer, and then Ali Stair PRs is, uh, work as a product designer. Uh, basically, we have the same. Uh, background, we, we work at the architectural uh, client, mostly an interior design company. This is uh, Alistair Biar's uh, projects and design. And this is uh, what I'm doing in Contour in Indonesia. And then we think that uh, because we, we have doing research on cigarette butt, and then uh, I think Ali have a uh, nice character of design, uh, his design. And then we think that uh, we separate our work. Uh, Ali doing the, to get inspired from the design uh, that he doing uh, called the dimple. And then this, the dimple is inside, uh, inspired from, I don't know what, what is the uh, mountain, Kawah, what is Kawah? I forget for the, the, the English of Kawah. And then, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this, this one, uh, the, the color direction that Ali gave to me, uh, he want to, Fab, uh, can you develop with uh, this earth color? Because uh, mostly what I'm doing in Indonesia is uh, we use gray or terracotta color or black. And then Ali uh, give me direction that I want to give color palette. And then this is the the step exploration what we're doing. We uh, Ali give me direction that how if we only use simple uh, shape, it's a square tile format. And then we give a small details, the dimple tiles. And then we 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 only do simple thing because uh, he saw that the cigarette butt texture result is already beautiful. And then uh, this is what uh, we organize the, the tiles. And this, this is the color testing of our process to develop. This is also to check the, the color. And this is the, the, the development result the tone, and then this is also how uh, we make the tiles. This is the final results that we choose. And then uh, after finish, we have a chance to uh, exhibit our products to uh, ICAT. It's a good impression. Uh, we talk many designer there uh, and also architect as to how we do the process, how we do the design and how the program of Ultra Matter is very exciting. exciting. It's also, we show uh, the materials that we use. And this is uh, also our chance. Uh, my studio have a branch company in Tokyo right now in Asagaya. Uh, and then uh, in January, we do exhibition to introduced in architect, uh, for architect in Tokyo. This is also showing dimple tiles here. And then uh, showing what we do in uh, waste material. Okay, now we work to prepare for mass production. So, uh, so uh, our last discussion with Ali is, uh, we both can make this uh, product uh, Ali can we can make with uh, the design can use the design. Me also can use the design, uh, and also now or not only using cigarette, but uh, so the design is uh, represent uh, the idea, and then the waste can replace not only cigarette, but but also the disposable mass or C cell waste or many things uh, or or uh, multi layer plastic. Yeah, thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Febren. That's You've been very busy, haven't you, developing so many new ideas. Um, and again, I've got, I've got loads of questions I'd love to ask you, but I'm going to have to make sure the audience get the chance to ask those as well. Um, I think what, what you and Adi have, have shown us is um, you can make incredibly beautiful objects from really um, not nice <laughs> sources of material and you can do some, some really impressive work. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm gonna move over now to, to Steph, who's gonna talk a bit about her practice um, here in Scotland and give us maybe a little bit of a summary of, of the sorts of work that's going on in this part of the world. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to you, Steph. Great, thanks, Carol. Um, it's so nice to be here. Um, I helped facilitate Alter Matter One, so it's great to be back um, and see lots of familiar faces. Um, and thanks for the invitation to talk. Um, it's been great hearing about how the cow dung has been transformed into these beautiful products. And I love the idea of how you pivoted, um, I guess, the sort of designs to help sort of keep it financially sustainable as well. Um, and also the, the, the input of um, working with the community too. So I think all around a really great project to hear about. And um, nice to revisit Fabrian's um, the concrete dimple tiles with the cigarette butts. And it's nice to see how you've kind of yeah, progressed since then. So um, yeah, amazing. So I'm just going to share a screen just now. Um, as I said, and as Carol's mentioned, I'm going to cover a little bit about my own work, which is quite relevant to the project because I've always been interested in alternative materials and it's been a priority in my practice in terms of how I design. Um, so let me just get some slides up. And then after I cover a little bit about myself, um, I'll talk about a few projects that I think are Again, really interesting for the audience in terms of the materials used and the kind of processes um, and ways um, they've developed materials. So, um, yeah, as I said, I'm an artist jeweler. Um, I trained um, at Glasgow School of Art and I've been practicing for about 10 years now. Um, so, yeah, I explore geology and rock formations as a way to inform my, my work. And I aim to bring a sort of, <clears throat> sorry, contemporary. Um, aesthetic, not much dissimilar to how you kind of present your work from the other speakers, um, by using traditional lapidary processes, which um, means stone cutting. Um, so I cut a lot of found um, and discarded rock to create jewellery and objects. Um, these are paired with either recycled or fair trade materials, uh, sorry, metals. Um, and I've been making my own rocks recently from different waste streams, such as e-waste, plastic, glass and ceramics. So I'll show some of those. But just to give you a little bit of a taste of um, my work, um, here are some model shots of some of the designs um, that I, I make. Um, these are the original rings I created back in 2018 um, as part of the first Scottish rock collection. Um, and they're inspired by the geometry of um, mineral structures. And these are um, marbles from the Isle of Skye and a feldspar from Loch Long. Um, and so from those rings, as they were the first thing I designed, um, the interchangeable ring um, was designed as a playful way to reuse the, the middle parts of those other rings. So exploring a zero waste concept to make the most of the resources um, that we have available. Um, and so this image here sort of illustrates um, how I design um, and use every part of the material. So the concept um, can be used for all the materials that I kind of design and make. This is a solid rock, but I also use the rocks that I make and can process them this way. And so um, I sort of just wanted to include that as a way of how I design. So I guess it's thinking about the material before the actual physical outcome. And um, so it's it's kind of turning the way we design on its on its head, so or, or the way we traditionally design. So you would usually maybe design a, a an item, whether it be jewelry or a product, um, and then you would source the material that you wanted to use. But for me, I do it the opposite way around. And I think as material designers, um, that's kind of the way we're having to sort of uh, kind of rethink the way we, that we work within our industries. Um, 
So just a sort of brief overview of my studio and process. So I find my rocks on beaches and walks. Um, I divert waste rock from landfill by collecting materials from construction sites and industrial um, and other industries that produce rock um, that would usually just skip it. So I, I kind of swoop in and, and I, yeah, take it away. Um, my studio is in Glasgow. Um, I have some um, machines that I kind of cut and shape all the rock in-house and the metal um, that I work with as well for melting and reshaping because metal you can reuse over and over again. The tools I have are sourced kind of historically from the 70s when stone cutting was like a really popular um, hobby, but there's not that many people um, in the UK, I'm not sure about Indonesia actually, maybe someone could tell me that um, stone cut, so actually um, all my skills are self-taught. But those skills can then be um, I guess used in other ways. So this is I've just put in a few kind of samples of the work um, since 2020 um, that I've been using. This was a collaborative project where we worked and um, I worked with um, Poon, who's a tie maker. Um, it was another British Council project where we collaborated together on a residency, an intensive 10 day residency. And we were looking at problems of e-waste. So e-waste was from the UK getting transported to other places such as um, Thailand. And um, so we wanted to sort of look at the materials, break them down and see what kind of um, things we could make. So we created um, our own sort of rocks from different composites. So kind of um, looking at really sort of simple ways um, of breaking down an old phone smashing up the plastics um, and sort of remelting them into these other types of rocks that I then kind of cut in the same way that I could use um, as an alternative to sort of stone. Um, so that kind of led on to other projects um, and I'm part of a group called Closing the Loop, which Carol and um, Claire are also part of. Um, and we kind of um, share our resources and our um, research together to try and sort of push each other and um, educate each other on how we can help sort of uh, cl close the loop really with the materials that we choose to use. Um, so in, in the picture on the right there is some ceramic waste um, that came from Carol, there's some of my rock waste and then there's some glass waste from another artist called Inga Paneer and um, what I've done there is I've sort of used really sort of simple methods or lo-fi methods of ways of trying to experiment to transform these materials um, into, again, for me, into rocks. So on the, the right of the screen, you can see that there's a small mini kiln that's actually a microwave kiln. Um, and you can do that in your house, actually, to melt glass um, and the other materials to grind them down to create pigments. So on a sort of really sort of small scale way, you can experiment and I think that's quite useful to think about um, in terms of this project because there's quite a small time frame to develop um, materials um, and so these were just ways of me transforming them so using a grinder pestle and mortar binding them with natural binders this is a, a, a an image of it being melted in the kiln to make these rock blobs and um, and then these are some of the outcomes. So this is where I've cut them to kind of make into the jewellery as well and creating my own um, glass slush slash sort of um, ceramic composites. And I just kind of threw this one in um, as well because this is uh, reusing um, rock on a larger scale. So this is taking um, a piece of rock that has been salvaged from an old um, church on an island in Scotland and then we've reused it. I worked with an architect to help me kind of upscale the way I practice um, and then we inlaid a piece of um, smile plastic which is a hundred percent post-consumer plastic that's been put together so we wanted to sort of create a piece that we talk about um, I guess a protest towards sort of um, the materials we use and um, how we think about as designers, we can kind of raise the subject of climate emergency. So the, the larger piece of rock is um, four, 400 million years old um, from the Devonian period. And then the, the, the top layer is plastic that, you know, comes from just now. Um, and then I just threw this one in as the last slide of my work, which I created during my degree show. And this is um, 
it's not actually real rocks, it's uh, scrap copper pipes um, from sort of the gas industry. So this uses a process called electroforming. Um, and it's, again, it's quite lo-fi, but it's, it's using um, copper sulfite as, as the sort of um, solution that's blue there that you can see. And it's using a positive current and a negative current to um, build up a layer of copper so these are hollow copper shapes that you've seen in the last slide. And it creates that on top of a piece of wax, the wax can get melted away and then you're left with these, these items. So it's a way of transforming old metal into something completely new. Um, so I thought it could be quite relevant to anyone that was interested. So um, for me, um, I guess you can see that my practice uses materials and processes to transform them as the starting point, and then that informs the design outcome. So moving on though, um, I wanted to show some examples of what others are doing in Scotland, um, from designer makers to scientists to material developers um, that work with a range of materials. So this is a duo called Chalk Plaster, and um, their names are Fionn and Stephen Blench, and they use a process called Skag, Skag Leola, I cannot pronounce it right. It's an Italian um, process that uses plaster to imitate marble or stone. And it's made up of um, get kind of ground plaster and pigments. And um, basically in the, in the slide, you can see that they use their um, pigment from rocks that are foraged from the beach. And they're also using a lot of their lime. So their plaster comes from oyster shells it's quite a light picture but you can see down here this is an oyster shell so they've dragged that down into sort of a powder mixed it with pigment and created these really beautiful um, high-end vessels um, too so I think they're also um, researching into reusing plaster boards so in the UK a lot of the, the kind of um, way we line our walls is with um, something called plasterboard and when um, buildings are torn down it usually just gets sent to landfill but they're trying to take it and reprocess it so they can then turn it and make it into these objects as well. Uh, another example of um, creating a different composite is a draft. So they're um, sorry he is based in Dundee it's Amaric Grenaud and he uses spent grain from um, distilling gin and whiskey. So he collects these and he collaborates with loads, um, local sort of brewers. And in, in the material here, you can see that there's juniper berries, um, citrus leaves, cardamom and lemongrass. And so he, he uses different sort of processes, probably similar um, to the, the cow dung actually, just when you were talking about your processes. Um, he dries them, mashes them, um, adds a natural binder and then molds them and uses heat pressure to dry them out. And then it turns into the solid material. Um, and I'm sure it also smells really nice. I don't know how long the smell would last for. So this solid material is then cut and used as a sort of surface decoration for these um, beautiful pieces of furniture that you can see to the right. Um, another um, project that I really, really love um, for the main reason that it sort of is trying to, um, I guess, approach approach design from a problem solving perspective is um, a collaboration between um, Still Life uh, Studio um, and D Dress for the Weather. So Still Life Studio um, is a product design studio, but they're also material developers. And Still Life, um, sorry, not Still Life, Dress for the Weather is an architect firm based in Glasgow. And they also are really interested in material um, development too. So this is a collaboration where they have reused and transformed um, the plastic waste from NHS. So um, for this, in this same um, illustration, it's the, the aprons that a lot of the nurses use that usually just get straight and put straight into the bin and would end up in landfill. And so each of these steel tops um, comes to 2.2 kilograms of um, waste plastic. So it stops that from going to landfill and um, they've made these chairs. But what's really great come from this project, um, the architecture firm Dress for the Weather have been working with um, NHS Lothians to see if they can design a system in-house at the hospital where they can um, recycle completely in-house. Um, so they would take these 
um, I guess, aprons. He's um, trying to look at the equipment they would then need to use to kind of melt it down and then remake kind of the plastic materials that they need within the hospital industry. So maybe remaking some of these aprons as well out of it. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. But um, on that note of closing the loop, um, there's another, um, I guess it's another duo um, and they're called Keynote and they are Dr. Sam Chapman and Professor Gabriela Madero and they are based in, in, in Lothians and they take construction waste um, from, I guess, like, um, yeah, the building industry and transform them into bricks. Um, so they're the world's first sustainable brick. They come in 13 colours, so they're actually really beautiful as objects as well. And um, these reduce carbon emissions and um, it, it stops the construction waste going to landfill. And so they've, what's really exciting is they've managed to kind of upscale and they have a factory now where they produce these bricks. So, you know, they can be ordered now for actually building, you know, a, a, a large size building. Because I think a lot, with a lot of these projects where we're looking at alternative materials, once upscaling, it becomes really expensive um, to do that. And I think that's, it's really nice to see something that's kind of followed through and has had funding to help then continue that. So um, yeah, it's always worth thinking about how, how would your um, material become um, upscaled? Um, and again, this project focuses on the circular economy. So it takes it, it puts it in place. And then when that's been um, finished with it, well then it can be reused into, into more bricks too. So um, that's uh, that. And I want to end on a high. So I have a project that's close to Carol's heart. Um, and yeah, so Carol, who's the moderator um, that's here with us today. And I just wanted to cover her project because I think um, as a project, it, it's been really sort of pivotal in, in a lot of things in Scotland. So um, Think Plastic um, was the exhibition that came from the Smart Plastic Group. But I think it was also the starting point, sorry, starting point for the Closing the Loop Group. Um, and it originated as a continuation of the Smart Plastic Group. And it's grown from, I think, four makers to 20, as it is at the moment that are working with all these alternative materials. Um, so the original Smart Plastic Group was Carol Sinclair, Carla Edwards, Lorna Fraser and Fiona Hutchison. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, at any point as I discuss this. Um, and um, Dr. Peter Wilkie. So basically, um, the group of makers got some funding to work with some scientists. And the scientists happened to be um, Dr. Peter Wilkie, who worked at the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens, and he was a specialist in different plants. And so they used a material called gutta percha, um, which is a bioplastic that comes from a tree. Is that right? Yeah, I think. Um, and so they had these materials at their disposal to experiment with and see if they could then transform them and bring them into the way they made their own practice. But they did also look at recycling plastics and um, making their own um, plastic composites from uh, PLA, which is a sort of biodegradable plastic, but um, I think using some of ceramic waste dust from, from Carol's practice as well. And so I think this is just, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the processes they use, but all the information, if you Google Think Plastic, you can find um, more details on that on through the Applied Arts website. But I think it was just an, a great example of how science meets art and that how um, working in collaboration really works to kind of push boundaries. Um, yeah, so that's my final slide. And um, there are so many more examples of, of what people are doing, but I, I only had like a small amount of time. So um, I think just to sort of summarize, using alternative materials, you can sort of, um, you have the opportunity to kind of problem solve and it gives, you know, a great narrative or story to sort of, tell your clients or customers, um, but you can also really educate on serious issues as well, such as using the, the cow dung and um, the cigarette butts like we've heard of already. So um, yeah, thanks for listening. That'll be me for just now. Thank you so much, Steph. That was an amazing tour of all sorts of projects and thank you so much for mentioning ours. <laughs> I think, 
you know, what you've demonstrated is, is this very thing about the layers of um, content in these sorts of projects. It is about material development, but it's also about community development and it's about storytelling, isn't it? To raise the awareness. Um, so I think we've, we've got a fantastic question from Stephanie in the chat that I'm gonna come to in a second. But I think just, I wanted to maybe kick us off, uh, Steph, with coming back to you, just to ask you a little bit about the benefits of collaboration. Um, because everything I think that you've illustrated was a sort of group project. I think most people are in some sort of collaboration to extend their knowledge. And that's absolutely what the Alter Matter project is setting out to, to facilitate. So can you say a little bit about how you think a collaborative approach really benefits you creatively? Um, well, yeah, from first-hand experience, but also just looking at all the projects that I sort of showcased there, um, I guess you're sort of limited with your skill set. Um, and sometimes it's really great to work with other people that have similar interests, but also have the knowledge that you might not have. And so it's, you know, it's a, one, it's a quicker way of being able to resolve something that you're interested in, but don't have the knowledge of. But Two, it's also a way of really pushing yourself, you know, having, working with another individual, um, you know, you really question each other. And so you kind of discover things that you, you probably wouldn't have if you were working on your own and even learning a specific technique or process, but you don't have that other person's kind of, um, I guess it's a fresh set of eyes and insight into what your interests are. And I think just having those conversations are really valuable um, in terms of sort of how you, you can and work together and push push each other as well and also what's so great about this project is it, it comes from different cultural perspectives as well so you know there's so much more to learn I think um, within this one. Absolutely and I, I think just just to mention again going back to the other project um, the British Council project in Thailand one of the things I, I seem to remember that came up was just how interconnected our countries are in terms of the way that we handle waste and and therefore it is it's a problem we need to tackle together isn't it yeah so um i guess that project was born from um Poon and i's interest in sustainability and it you know we came across this this kind of shared issue of e-waste but us being the, the we kind of yeah the people that would send our e-waste onto Thailand that was causing pollution in their country so of course we should definitely be looking at ways where we can work together to resolve these issues um so yeah sorry <laughs> to answer that thank question. you Steph thank you I, I am going to come to to Stephanie's question in a moment but I'm just going to continue this collaboration thread and I want to come to you, Feb Brian, just to talk a little bit more about your collaboration through Alter Matter One. And just to get your take on how collaboration pushed your thinking for that project. Can yeah, you tell thank us? You. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Carol, for the question. Uh, I think the interesting part is. Uh, to share about how uh, Ali think about the design process. And also uh, what I'm doing here is different style. Uh, I see that uh, Ali bring uh, simplicity and his, uh, on his design. And then uh, when, uh, when uh, I'm proposing some, uh, some idea like, uh, how if this one, how if this one, how if this one, uh, many options, and then uh, they bring, uh, they bring the uh, his own style about the uh, fab. Maybe we only do some little bit uh, tweak on simple things like square. Uh, I think it's the 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 interesting part is the like doing make a stop and go and stop and go and for for uh, about the discussion about design and process reasons. I think that's the the interesting part of the collaboration with Altermatter project. Yeah, fantastic and. And with there being um, quite a short time to, yeah. to, to make progress, do yeah. you think that it's useful to have someone else to, to sort of uh, drive you forward and, and be answerable to? 
I think uh, the 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 hard moment is uh, when we need to get the best result of the research because uh, we only have a short time. Uh, that's why when, when we 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 know that we separate into two uh, two tasks. Uh, me as a material designer and uh, Ali work as a designer, and then it's easy to get the, the the design expectation but the result we need to i think we need more times because the, the maybe uh, for me uh, it's enough maybe for alice uh, Fab, can you change the a little bit darker the color uh, it, it's a yeah we need more time for to explore the the final result so uh, like i'm explaining uh, we only got to to color that we approve uh, both of us because uh, in our first plans, we have four colors, and then we only get two colors because yeah, we need we need more time to get uh, more exact colors that we want. So, can I ask? Is you you mentioned that you've been speaking to your collaborator again? Are you still collaborating? Are you still working together? Uh, last year we talked about uh, what we can do with. Uh, the dimples, but uh, he have uh, many projects, so they he cannot uh, through uh, to the collaboration again. I think uh, maybe this year we'll we'll talk and what we can do again for other projects. Yeah, it sounds like this is a great way to make a long term relationship. Yeah. It may not be that you work together all the time, but you can always come back together again and discuss things. I think. Uh, I'm also curious if if we can bring the dimple tiles uh, to get more exhibition in Ali side, maybe in Scotland. Um, if if he had more chance to get uh, exhibition there, and then maybe uh, I can send more samples and many things to to exhibit there. But I think we hope uh, can do exhibit more uh, event. Yeah. Yeah, of course, that's another benefit of this project is the opportunity to reach new audiences and new markets. Yeah. Um, so yes, thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm now going to come to the first part of Stephanie's question, and I'm going to come back to you, Adi, and I'm going to ask you uh, that Stephanie's question's in three parts, but the last part is, how did you know or believe that there was a there was potential in using cow dung? Because it might not have seemed obvious to everybody. So, so tell us about that bit first. Okay, thank you. This is very interesting. Well, before we communicate with uh, the villagers, the with, with the community in the village, uh, we first make a. Uh, of course, make a research experiments that, in fact, the material can be washed and we can clean it and there is no more smell from that. So after clean, it's maybe, I, I would say that only 5% that we can smell, but it, it's not really, really strong. It is very mild. And then now we have already, we know how to make it really zero smell of the cow dung. After only after we we know that we get that uh, and then we produce it and then we show to the to the people to the community in the villages that hey what uh, now we we have this kind of object that is made of your cow dung <laughs> production so and of course they're really enthusiastic to see it and then. Uh, when before we really come to the uh, uh, make a collaboration with the villager, uh, we did some kind of uh, ethnographical research. We we make a like ethnography mapping in the village, and then we make a lot of data. Uh, what is the main work, and then. Uh, how many people doesn't have job? And then uh, this is mostly women. They don't have a job or young people. And then how they how they expect from us 
if we make something. So, and then we invite them almost three times. We make a meeting, we make gathering, we eat together, and then we make food together. And then from that, we start to, to show our research. And then they really see, and then they really smell that, wow, this is our cow dung, but it's, it's not smell anymore. And then it's so clean. And then with that step, so they're really enthusiastic to involve in this project. And I think the most important thing is uh, they understand that if they involve and they can get uh, extra income for, for the family economy. So I think uh, this is how we, we get in touch and then we try to collaborate and then to convince that this project is worth it for us and then for them. And then we can collaborate and continue to, to work together. So I think this is the most uh, interesting part of our project that our ideas is, was uh, accepted by the, by the community and then community were very glad to, to involve in this project. Fantastic, very clever way to take what was the problem of, of the smell and turn it into an advantage by giving jobs and work to the to the community. That's that's a that's a very important set of steps, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, from the beginning, so our team have discussed so uh, this research is not useful, it's only for us. So well, I work in Itebe. Uh, my position is uh, as a head of research center for cultural and environmental products. And our aims also to like to build uh, some kind of community development together with uh, uh, increasing the creative economy in any areas in Indonesia. So mm -hmm. our aims was when we deal with this project. So it is very clear that if this result uh, should be, could be easily applied to the uh, local people in the area where the project is. So uh, that's, that, that was really our aim that this project should be uh, useful or has a benefit for, for, for many people who live in this in this area. Yeah. Fantastic. So a really big set of collaborations to, to make impact. Um, that's a great, a great story. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping that because I think you've inadvertent you've you've answered all the layers of Stephanie's question because she was keen to know how you worked with the community and how you got past this idea of the dirt, but you've explained all of that beautifully. So yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, if you have any other questions, sub questions from that, please pop them in the chat and we can ask. Um, but I think I want to go back to um, Fabrian and ask you really the same sort of question in terms of using cigarette butts, because again, that's not an obvious material choice. Um, I know that, you know, you talk about the, it, it being a, a really um, enormous problem of waste. You know, I think we've all seen streets, scat, you know, um, with lots of cigarette butts causing all sorts of problems, but also the toxins that, you know, it's really not a very nice <laughs> material to work with. So how did you know to, what, what prompted that ex exploration? Yeah. Uh... We try to work with uh, Parongpong. Parongpong is a waste company that we work uh, with Contour because uh, in my studio, we do uh, only research uh, hygiene material after uh, Parongpong processing using a hydrothermal machine. Uh, all, the, all the waste material, cigarette butt waste, uh, disposable mass waste, uh, yeah. Multi-layer plastic, all the all the waste material already proceed from uh, hydrothermal machine, and then come already clean to our studio, and then we do we do research uh, and found the which mix formula to 
match with the result, the, the texture, the, the the quality. We check the the strengthness of the concrete, how uh, it will be dry and ready to open. Uh, yeah, we always work with Parong Pong to help us to get the hygiene uh, waste material. So uh, in my studio, we only do research after the the material already clean. Okay. Okay. So so again, collaboration and about working in partnership to yep. be able to tackle the problem. So had they identified the problem ahead of them bringing the material to you? I'm just wondering, you know, again, what's the starting point in coming to this kind of project? Uh, I think the the hard things is if only we do uh, research, only one or two products for uh, research, it's easy for us. But the, the thing is if we make some design and then uh, we found a customer that want to buy many stuff of our uh, our projects and then yeah i think the the if we think that uh, waste is uh, we have many ways but uh, parobong also uh, need partner to help to collect the the waste because uh, we 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 already got uh, some situation that in counter we already uh, use three tons of cigarette butt waste into hundred projects uh, in three out three years in three years, and then uh, we now we only we only have I think it's only two hundred kilo of uh, cigarette butt. The the point is we think that we don't do the 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 task as a designer. We do the finish the research, and then if we think about the problem of cigarette butt waste. I think, uh, yeah, we, we need uh, another partner to help the waste material. That's why we we also doing many materials that uh, we know right now as disposable mass waste, it can be replaced 100% of uh, sand using in concrete materials. And the interesting part is this, the waste, uh, disposable waste, it's cut 50% of weight of concrete, normal concrete. I think it's uh, like every waste material can come come up with the different uh, texture, different character, different weight. Yeah, I think it's uh, the interesting part of what we're doing on uh, architecture project because they do always mass production. Uh, and also we think the, the cycling of the waste material and then we research, we done the research and then we got the cycling of project waste material and we do the research and design. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, so many layers and stages yep. to getting to a final product. Um, and as you say, even then, prototypes are just the beginning of, of yeah. new discovery. We, we well, need three, three years for uh, finish the research of cigarette okay. pathway. Okay. Great. Good to good to know. It's that sort of commitment to to getting something to to a final stage. Um, I think that probably also leads us really nicely into the the question that Levina has asked, which is, you know, she's saying she's acknowledging it's just amazing to see so many of these projects and initiatives, you know, reframing the way we think about waste and. I think she's she's really keen to know your all of your thoughts on whether these projects are going to have an impact in changing people's behaviors so that they start to look at the way that they create waste in a different way. And I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Steph, um, because I think the, the, the kind of awareness raising of this type of work is a really important part of its of its benefit, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think, again, it all comes down to the narrative of it and the storytelling aspects of all the projects that we've seen today and also from the original Ultramata project. And I think it's about how we sort of try to normalise the or using waste or or maybe even changing the narrative of um, the, that no material is actually waste and that it's more of a potential. So... Um, so yeah, it's maybe just sort of eliminating the idea of waste as, as a thing or, or referencing it as waste. It's just like this is, you know, we can try and see the potential in everything. And I think especially with the, the, the cigarette butts and the cow dung, you know, there's 
I wouldn't have thought about potential in that, but you know, we've been proved today that there's, there definitely is. And yeah, I think it is just sort of through education and conversations and continuing to sort of showcase these things um, that we normalize that. Um, and I think for me, the way I make, I make in a way where, you know, I make everyday products, but I also try and challenge myself to make things that are more about um, like having that conversation. For example, the bench, that's quite a large item. Um, and when you sit on it, hopefully people try and kind of reflect on those ideas as well. So it's kind of putting um, these, not examples, but these products in, in kind of within the public and just asking them to sort of respond to it. Um, yeah, sorry, that's my answer. No, it's great. It's true. It's, it's, it's so important to have these layers in, in the project. Because um, I suppose coming coming back to you, Addy, the, the, there must be enormous potential to catch people's attention when you tell them that you use cow dung. That must be, there must be great uh, interest in what you're doing beyond just the community that you're working with. I can imagine your your story is is something people are really interested in. Yeah, sure. Uh, every time we have a... Uh exhibition for example our first exhibition in singapore there are so many uh, uh media uh will write our story including cnn so forth so and then what's interesting is also there are some uh like design galleries in Australia, in India, because I know that India has also problem with cow dung. Yeah, even worse. I mean, even bigger. So they they come to me and then ask for the collaboration. Like uh, like in Australia, they they want to sell our product or to promote our product in Australia, and India they want to make a collaboration to develop other product that is fit with in the Indian culture and Indian market. So I think uh, because this is new and then uh, it is, I mean, it's so sexy that uh, we can make something from cow dung and then it's really, I mean, uh, with the potentiality of good design and then a sexy design. So it, it can go to the good market, I, I, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think uh, it's also interesting that to see uh, how 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 people respond, that uh, how how it's possible that everybody who see the exhibition they always smell the product and then they they really I mean they really eager that this is just like plastic you can uh, almost make everything from cow dung also yeah yeah and I said. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> and as long as people have a cow, I mean, as long as there is a farm for cow and then we, we always have the material for that. Yeah. I think that is the positive thing of this material. Yeah. <laughs> it's, these are phrases I'd never thought I'd hear. The sexy products made from cow dung is a great phrase. <laughs> we'll have to use it a lot. <laughs> uh. Mm. Fantastic. And I, I, I hope that answers your question, Levina. If, if there's anything else you want to ask, please, please pop that in the chat. But I thought maybe we could move on a little bit to more of the practicalities of people getting involved in Alter Matter 2. You know, I, I definitely invite anyone in the audience, if you've got a practical question, please pop that in the chat now. Um, but I wanted to maybe kick that off by asking each of our speakers in turn, what sort of advice you would give to someone who is maybe at an earlier stage of, of new material development? What sorts of things should they be thinking about? What are the practicalities? I think some of the things Steph mentioned in terms of using, you know, your kitchen equipment or using something that's that comes easily to hand and isn't an enormous investment. Um, and possibly also to reassure potential applicants to Ultimata that you don't have to work with, you know, cow dung or cigarette butts or dangerous materials. It's not, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you can choose something else that's perhaps 
quite plentiful around you. Um, but yeah, could, could I come to you, Steph? What's, what's your thoughts on how do you get this kind of project kicked off? What do you need to think about? Um, for me, I like thinking about what problems could be solved um, in terms of, uh, I guess, for me locally. So, for example, like finding kind of um, the kind of disused rock that would end up in landfill, I can kind of collect that and use that. But um, yeah, so thinking about what you could maybe do problem solving within your within your kind of local local space, um, but also having um, an element of like play. I think you really just have to kind of relax into it and really kind of use the material and just play with it for a while because it's it takes a you know it takes a little while to sort of see what its potentials can be um so think about maybe testing it out and maybe as many ways you can say like 10 ways and do it fast try not think too much about it and just sort of enjoy the process of seeing what it can do and you know um for me i like to sort of um grind it down or try and burn it or you know like obviously within sort of health and safety um you know spaces um but yeah so just sort of yeah be playful with it and enjoy the process and um yeah see what kind of issues you could solve locally but um yeah for me like chapping on doors um at local kind of businesses to see what their waste streams are could be a good starting point um to see what's around you or if if, if there's a material you already have and want to use maybe get in touch with other people that have kind of either used it in the past to sort of see how how uh, um how their process have developed, I think, um, within this sort of community of people that are working towards sort of um, more sort of sustainable ways. People are generous with their kind of knowledge and information because you're all working towards something that's for the greater good rather than um, yeah, keeping it to themselves. So, um, yeah. I, great, thank you. And, and I love that idea of play because really play is what we're all good at as creative thinkers, um, whatever angle you come from. Um, and play is where unexpected things happen that can be really helpful. So thank you for that. And also enjoyable. I mean, that's also part of this is to go on a really interesting creative journey. Um, so coming to you then, Fabrienne, what would be your tips on somebody for somebody coming to material development at a fairly early stage? What should they be thinking about? I think. Uh learn from many researchers uh, on materials and then also try to explore but the, the technicality of uh, exploration. I mean, uh, maybe uh, Adi doing uh, from that material, many, many, many process can do become many results. Me also in, in concert, uh, we need three three years to to get the best result of uh, cigarette butt waste because uh, we mix with uh, the first process. Uh, we need we put fifty percent of cigarette butt and then we we use thirty uh, percent and then the final is only ten percent. Uh, it looks small for percentage, but in in ten percent of one kilo is we need fifty cigarette butt. So I think, uh, yeah, we we need more time, of course, to to get the the best result, and no need to hurry about the research process. I think yeah. that's for me. Yeah, no, that's really. It, it also reminds me. I know in my own experimentations, I have to remind myself to keep really good notes so that I remember if it's thirty percent or twenty percent or you know half an hour or five minutes. Um, I know that, you know, some of the mixtures that Steph and I worked on um, melted onto my kiln shelf, which was not ideal. So I had to remember not to do that again. Um, yeah. So, yes, keeping good notes, being playful, but also being, but also I think the silly things in a way, but looking after your health, wearing gloves, wearing a mask. These are yep. really important things, aren't they? To make sure you survived your experiments. Um, that we want you to come and tell us how it went. So we need you to be healthy. Um, what about what about you, Adi? What's what's your thoughts on how to get material experimentation off the ground? Yeah, uh, for me, first we have 
to have a good team. Like I said in the, my presentation, we have a multidisciplinary uh, team, which is not only designer. We have uh, uh, scientists who uh, uh, concentrate in the material studies. We have also a, a technical, uh, mechanical engineer who can produce the tools to, to help the experiment. So I think this is very important to have a multi team from multidisciplinary approach. And then the second is that uh, we have the knowledge. I think that is very important. Um, uh, we have uh, the, the knowledge how to do that and then how to experiment. And yeah, after that, then if we are doing experiment, of course, we need small, less or more, some kind of uh, tool to, uh, to, to help the experiment. And mm -hmm. then the last, of course, uh, funding <laughs> grant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I work in a research uh, center, so we have a yearly grant, so it is safe for us. And then what is good, is when the the result is become more and more clear so we can get even more grant from other institute or even from uh, abroad so i think uh, grant or funding is also a good part of this this uh, material research because without that uh, it's kind of of course, we can also make it, but uh, a lot of obstacle and a lot of problem concerning that we, we cannot do it in a very ideal way. So last or not least, uh, we have to connect to the people, uh, uh, to the community. And also when the research start, we already see the possibilities market possibility, uh, what, what kind of market that can absorb our innovation or our, uh, our experiment in material. I think that is also very important. If we are really not clear what kind of market that can absorb our, uh, our research. So I think for me, it's not, not very interesting, it's only just uh, researching something uh, in uh, in the name of only research Absolutely. for the sake of research <laughs> yeah yes, I, I mean i think we all love to play just for the just for the fun of it but as steph says it's really useful to have a problem to solve isn't it it's it's yeah, it's yeah really sure to kind of think why are, why are we doing this work um yes. i'm actually i i also want to pick up on that thing about funding and i'm going to come to kemi just to talk about that in a second but what what I want to also do is uh, pick up Carrie's question because she was she's saying that she she's not quite sure perhaps how those matches will be made um, because the application asks if it, if you're a product designer or a material developer. So I thought perhaps actually, Gemi, you could answer that one too. Is is how the matches had been made in the past uh, round and and why we're looking for people with different disciplines. Thanks, Carol. Um, that's a really good question, Carrie. And um, I think what we have tried to do in the past is because last year was a bit of a pilot um, for us. And we were also trying to experiment how we would be able to pair different designers and makers in a collaboration team. Um, we wanted to make sure that we have one person who represents the Indonesian design sector and one person who represents the UK design sector. Um, and in that particular team, one person would be maybe having more experience in the development of materials, while the other would maybe have um, more experience in development of products. So that is how we try to match uh, people based on their applications. And we also try to look through their portfolio, their CVs and resumes, um, their application forms and um, their statement letters um, <clears throat> to see whether or not um, these people would make a great pair. 
And um, I think luckily we had some really good uh, collaborations that came out of it. Uh, as an example, Febrian and Alistair, um, they seem to be working very well together. And I think this is an example of how we try to identify, you know, the strengths of um, each of the applications and then try to make sure that everybody, um, the, the other complements them, basically. So that's the understand um, that's the process that we've tried to approach in the past um, but we're also of course looking forward to seeing what kind of applications come through this round um, so uh, we will probably have maybe a similar approach but also um, yeah it will also depend on what kind of uh, applications come through yeah like I think Carrie's just asking for a bit clarification further clarification um, really that sort of sense of do, do product designers have any hand in the development of materials and do material developers do any designing? And I, I think maybe from what happened before, there was, a, there was an exchange of skills to some degree and a very communal approach to what comes out of it. Would that be fair? Yeah, and I think... Um... It's very, in a way, very fluid. I mean, we, we of course, encourage that kind of fluidity of roles across the teams. Um, it will, of course, depend on um, your own team. So if you have been paired with a, um, another designer, um, it would be good for you to maybe have some kind of discussion or agreement with each other about how you are um, thinking about approaching the project and whether or not, for instance, if you come from a material background, but you're interested in um, having some contribution to the product design aspect, then maybe make that aware in the beginning um, so that uh, both of you are coming through with uh, you know, the same level of expectations around the project and the division of the roles. Great, thanks, Cami. that's very, practical. Um, I'm just going to ask actually the other um, kind of collaborating partners if they've got any specific advice on how applicants should fill in the application. I mean, are there particular things that would be useful to see in the application? I'm, I'm looking at you, Claire, as you're going, oh, no, don't ask me this question. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of what, what is the, the kind of information that would be really helpful to you as somebody who's going to make those matches? What would you like to see in an application? Um, I, I think just sort of amplify your interests, really. If you're a designer working in materials, then, you know, say it. Um, give us some examples. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just be very straightforward about what you're looking for out the project. Absolutely, yeah. What about colleagues from Playo? What Adil? Did you do you have a thought on that? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, what we try to find is uh, our, who uh, the designers who are uh, can working together, not just you know have a good products or uh, have a good design or the great prototypes of their own projects but, but also we, we try to find uh, how uh, they communicate uh, each other uh, because we also want to put some uh, cultural understanding through this uh, project so uh, we don't want just you know find like the great designers for this project so I think that that also uh, will make a good point how uh, the designers will uh, approach to this uh, project yeah yeah Great, thanks. Any any other thoughts on that, Cami? Yeah, I, I think when we're selecting, I, it, what's lovely about it is that we have this kind of rich variety of work and what people do. And I think the joy about it is trying to kind of match these makers and designers and material developers. Um, to try and complement each other. So we're kind of in the background kind of going, okay, what we're seeing is this application form. So just show us everything you're interested in and why you really want to embrace this collaboration. And we'll hopefully pick up on that and then um, kind of marry, marry this collaboration and um, kind of move it forward and push it and kind of pick out what we think, you know, Maybe there's, there's this material that could just do wonders in the hands of this sort of product designer and 
we try our best to kind of match it and yeah make some magic happen yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it exciting. definitely did happen last time round. so you're clearly very good matchmakers all of you so that's that's a good sign um and and Steph I think has said very practical you know provide some lovely visuals you know it's so much easier to see what you're doing through some images than perhaps you know some some lengthy text um I know that we often feel like applications have to be just in the written form but really this is about visuals as well so make sure you have some really good a really good portfolio to present so people understand where you're coming from and process uh, as well we love to see process um so kind of don't be afraid of experiments that haven't gone anywhere or that didn't work um because process is as valuable as end product absolutely absolutely great any is there anything else any other thoughts on the application process from from any of the the partner organizations anyone got any tips I suppose the main one is just please apply it was, it's such an exciting project we want to, <laughs> we want to have lots of people applying um and making some exciting new matches yeah so I think we're probably getting to the last few minutes of our our session together is there anything anything the speakers would like to just throw into the mix if we I mean, I, I think we could probably have conversations about your amazing projects for hours um, and really appreciate you sharing what you have. But is there anything else you wanted to throw in? Any other tips for, for our whole new world of material development? Just do it. Would that be a tip? Yeah. And any other questions from our audience? Anything we've not answered? This is your moment. Speak up or type up. Oh, it's quiet. Well, I think we've maybe we've maybe said a lot. I, I hope what we've done today is really inspire people to make an application. Because I think certainly for me, listening to our speakers, um, you know, listening to, to Kami and you know, talk about the partners and why they're behind this project. It's such an exciting and important project. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your stories to inspire us all to get on and do some really good stuff. Um, I think that's probably. Carol, I will uh, share something. I think uh, if yeah. uh, there is a participant will uh, join the Ultimate uh, uh, second volume uh, volume uh, mm -hmm. i think it's a great experience for me as a product designer uh, and also material designer uh, and i think for carrie don't worry to uh, to do the playful progress on the the automatic program and then i think the the the, the key is the good communication with the partner uh, maintain the communication and also always update uh, the progress and then uh, just just say it about the the idea i think it's, uh, the important the important things for me and ali it's uh, we have a good communication because we always update and comment what we do uh, process and progress uh, uh, it's uh, both of us and i think it's uh, Ultimately, it's a good program for designer and material designer to get new experience uh, for us. Yep, thank you. Great, no, that's a really good point. And I think to to emphasize that it's a, it's about equal partnership, isn't it? Everybody's got to contribute and, and respond to one another and, and, you know, sort of come to this with a, a level of commitment to make it work and to make it worthwhile. So um, great tip there, thank you. Okay, so yeah, there's obviously you can get in touch with us after the event to ask more questions. Um, can I just ask our event coordinators where the people will find the recording of this session? Is that going to be made available on one of the websites? 
yeah so people can can look on the links that we've already shared perhaps they could could these are in uh the chat now um the link to the brief and to the application um and there'll be more information in there and routes to asking further questions if you need support um so I'm going to wrap things up. I'm going to say a huge thank you to all of our project facilitators, you know, to, to the partners who are making this amazing project happen. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to our speakers for, for just providing such amazing, inspiring stories to, to get us all excited about material development. Um, and, and, you know, the importance of that in terms of of working together and tackling, you know, the, the, the climate emergency and the, the pollution problems that we've we've really got to, to face head on. And we can do it together and we can make progress. So onwards and upwards, I'd say. Let's do this thing. Thank you very much, everybody.